This morning we're going to tackle a uh, rather lengthy chapter, and uh, I'd like to begin by reading the, uh, the chapter, if I can find it. Got to get in the right book. Here we are. I was looking at Romans 10. I was thinking, that's not so long, but it's uh, Acts 10, which is considerably longer. Okay. All right. So Acts chapter 10. I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 48. We'll look at this essentially in, in four sections. The first is uh, basically how the Lord prepares Cornelius to receive the gospel. Uh, secondly, how the Lord prepares Peter to share the gospel. Thirdly, how Peter goes and ministers the gospel to Cornelius and his household. And then finally, that very important part, which is the main part of this whole thing, how the Spirit descends on those Gentiles in Cornelius' household and how they are saved, but again, receiving a gift that I think up to this point, the Jews believed was reserved for the Jews alone. And that is this, again, this, this work of the Holy Spirit, uh, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we understand is, is not this charismatic experience, but is rather the uh, thing which places us in the body of Christ. But the thing that signals the fact that they have received the Spirit is, of course, they're speaking in tongues. And on the basis of that, Peter says, Let's baptize them, and let's put the mark of God's covenant upon them and recognize their inclusion. You know, Peter's going to be called on the carpet for this in the next chapter. You went to the Gentiles, and you ate with them, and then Peter shares with them what the Lord did, and he says, oh, they say, God has, has received the Gentiles. That was new. That was, um, again, uh, this is a new step in, in the progress of, um, of the gospel. Okay, so beginning in verse 1 of chapter 10. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he had became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up, and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth <laughs> and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter! Kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, Behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate, and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, there are men looking for you, but get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you were looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. 
As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I asked for what reason you have sent for me. Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments, and he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. <clears throat> Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the things which, or the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Well, as I've said, it's a long text. But again, I want to divide it into those four different areas. Now, let me just again remind us of what we saw last time. I hate for us to leave behind, you know, the things that we've seen, but inevitably we have to. But perhaps one last time just to sort of enforce it. Last time we saw two miracles, the healing of Aeneas and the raising of Tabitha from the dead that taught us three lessons. The first one we don't want to forget because it's very important for our apologetic, and that is the evidential power of miracles. Okay, both of these miracles were demonstrations of God's authority. He did something only He can do, showing that He was present, that His Word was being preached. Now again, we're reminded that miracles do not, they cannot change hearts by themselves. But they certainly do serve to focus attention, don't they? to focus attention on those who were speaking so that those who see the miracles might listen to the gospel and that the Spirit might convert them. Now, we know the Lord doesn't continue to confirm His Word with miracles today because He already did that when He first gave it. What we are to do is simply point to the miracles recorded in the Word of God that confirm what we are saying actually is from Him. I've already told you that's going to be a very key element of R.C. Sproul's argument, the classical argument for the Bible being the Word of God. And if I may, Jesus comes, He does miracles, it proves He's from God, and Jesus says the Bible is the Word. The Scriptures are the Word of God. That's all we need to prove that the Bible is the Word of God if we simply even just accept the Bible as being a reliable history which we would accord to any other book of antiquity. 
we have these several witnesses who saw the miracles of, of Jesus. So the evidential power of miracles. Secondly, the fact that the new birth changes lives. We saw how much Saul was changed. He went from being one who wanted to destroy the church and kill all the Christians to one who gave his life, even put his life at risk, to preach the gospel to others so that they might be saved. Now, we also saw that change in Tabitha. Her heart was so filled with the love of God that she gave herself freely in acts of love and charity. Remember, uh, especially towards the poor widows who were weeping and lamenting the fact that this one who had ministered to their needs for so long had been taken from them. Now, again, how do we know that we are born again by the Holy Spirit? It's not just that we believe the facts. It is that our lives are transformed from the inside out by the Spirit of God. Now, the third thing we saw was God's providential guidance. Remember how the Lord put it on Peter's heart to go out and visit the newly established churches to see how the new converts were getting along. In Lydda, there was a man, Aeneas, who had been bedridden for many years, and he healed Aeneas. Around that same time, Tabitha suddenly dies, but the disciples who were in Joppa, where Tabitha lives, hear that, that Peter is in Lydda and that he had healed Aeneas, and so they asked him to come down and to pray for Tabitha and when he prayed, the Lord healed her. But you see, there was also another plan. I should say that was just simply part of the plan that was already going on. God's plan was to move Peter to Joppa so that uh, he might bring him all the way to Caesarea where he might preach to the first of the uncircumcised, that he might bring them into his church. And this is God's providential guidance. I mean, it's going on all the time, not just in the lives of the apostles, but also in our lives. Now, what I want us to look at again are these four things from this text. The Lord preparing Cornelius to receive the gospel. The Lord preparing Peter to minister the gospel to Cornelius. His ministry of that gospel. And then finally, the first Gentile Pentecost. There are a couple of overarching things we want to see in this passage, but we're going to see a lot of others, a lot of other applications as we go through it. Now, first of all, we see the Lord prepare Cornelius to receive the gospel. Now, Luke begins by introduce, introducing us to this rather unusual man. He gives us a few of his details. That's one thing it's, you know, we like about Luke, is he gives us plenty of details and the, 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 uh, what we would, should suspect would be the, tr uh, the case. When the details of Luke are compared to what we learn from history, we find, as uh, I believe it was Ramsey who said, the great uh, archaeologist, that Luke was a first-rate historian. Well, first he tells us that Cornelius was a centurion. And one thing that's interesting about centurions in the Bible is that they're often, often singled out as being those who are particularly responsive to the gospel. I mean, think about the centurions we're introduced to in the gospels. Jesus said to one centurion on one occasion, that he had never seen a man who had such great faith, not even among all the peoples of, of Israel, even among the Jews. In other words, God's people didn't have this faith. But here's this Roman centurion who does. And let's not forget, it was also a Roman centurion that stood at the foot of the cross, who seeing the darkness and the earthquake that was taking place, said, surely this man was the Son of God. Now we see this centurion and his household about to be the first Gentiles to be received into the church. Now, Luke tells us that he was a part of the, the Italian cohort. Cohort kind of sounds like a, like a group of thugs, but, but that's not what the word means, okay? Now, we're familiar with the word legion, right? Not just the demon-possessed guy, but legion was, was actually a term used for a, a group of Roman soldiers of about 6,000 soldiers, that had 60 centurions over them. Well, a legion was further divided down into 10 what are called cohorts, 600 soldiers each with six centurions each. And this tells us what we already know about the word centurion. It basically means that he is in charge or he is leader over 100 men. Now, whenever you know, help was needed in some region of the empire. It wasn't always a legion of soldiers that was sent. Sometimes it was a cohort. And these cohorts were sent throughout the empire as needed. And one was certainly needed 
uh, by the uh, uh, procurator at uh, Caesarea because the Jews in that area were restless. Now, being Italian means that Cornelius obviously was a Gentile. But Luke says he was no ordinary Gentile. He was a devout man, which means he was godly. Okay? He feared God along with his whole household. This tells us something about God's mercy on, on these people. But what he means, what Luke means by this is that this man was a God-fearer. A God-fearer is somebody who believed in the God of Israel and who worshipped the God of Israel, but who did not become a full proselyte to Judaism by receiving circumcision. So again, a God-fearer, a God-fearing Gentile. Like Tabitha, he was charitable. He showed his love for God. He showed his love for the Jews by giving alms to the nation. He prayed to God continually, which means that he was observing the three daily prayer times of the Jews. You know, we see references to this made throughout Scripture. One of them is when Daniel was in Babylon and, um, you know, he wasn't able to go to Jerusalem, he would open his window toward Jerusalem and three times a day in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, he would pray to God. Now, uh, what, what we see here is um, essentially what Jesus again tells us would be true of every believer. The grace of God changes the life and it makes us conform to the will of God. You know, one thing we might be a little bit perhaps unclear about is just exactly what Cornelius' status was before God. Is he simply an unbelieving Gentile? Uh, being a God-fearer, does that mean he's classified with the Jews and, and he's unconverted and basically needs to hear the gospel? I don't think that that's the case. I think what Cornelius was was actually an Old Testament saint, so to speak, though a God-fearing saint. I mean, were there people who were saved before Jesus came into the world? Well, yes, there were, and they were saved by looking forward to the Messiah and trusting in Him. That's how Joseph was saved. That's how Mary was saved. That's how Simeon and Anna were also saved. They were already new creatures in Christ before Jesus came. If we don't believe that, then we'd have to say everybody who lived and died before Jesus came essentially were lost. But we don't think that is the case. They believed in the Christ who was coming through the promises and the shadows. And the other thing that is interesting is because they already had a heart disposed toward God, because they were already trusting God's promise of sending the Messiah, when God finally sent the Messiah into the world, it was certain that when they heard about Jesus, that they would believe. And now that He had come, that's the message that needed to get to Cornelius and his household as it did all the Jews that already believed, as well as to the Jews that didn't believe and the Gentiles who didn't believe. Well, we see Cornelius, again, practicing what Luke says was true of him, his, his piety, his devotedness to God. And while he was praying, again, uh, according to the Jewish customs, at the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon, one of the Jewish, three, three Jewish hours of prayer, an angel appeared to him. The angel came to do what the author to the Hebrews said angels do. They were created in order to minister to those who inherit salvation. Cornelius was one of those, and, and we are as well. Even though we may not see them standing around in, in brilliant garments, we need to understand that the angels are present and the angels are ministering to us. We may not have a particular angel assigned to us, but they do minister on our behalf, and I think we're all aware of times when perhaps the Lord did actually do something through an angel to protect us. Well, the angel called to Cornelius, and as we might suspect, it made him somewhat afraid. Cornelius answered, what is it, Lord? And he wasn't thinking that this was God. He wasn't thinking that this was Jesus. But again, remember the word Lord can also be a title of respect, sir, okay? Uh, so I think he was simply referring to him in, in that way. The angel told him that his prayers and his alms had ascended into the presence of God and that the Lord had taken note of his sincerity. By the way, can an unbelieving 
Jew or Gentile, pray and God take note of sincerity of that prayer apart from the Holy Spirit? Not according to the Bible, okay? The Bible says that we have a heart that is it basically steeled in rebellion against God, and God does not have to listen to any of, of the prayers of the unbeliever at all, although He does sometimes do that. But He never sees sincerity in the heart of a person who is unconverted, which means that the Spirit of God must have been at work in Cornelius because that's the only way those prayers could have this, this quality that God would take note of. Well, the angel that he sent in response to this prayer told him to send some men to Joppa and to call for Peter, who was staying with Simon the Tanner, that he had a message that they needed to hear. And so Cornelius, as you might suspect, somebody whose heart is disposed toward the Lord and loves the Lord and wants to obey the Lord, immediately sent two of his servants and one of his soldiers to Joppa to urge Peter to come. So here we see Cornelius was now ready to receive the gospel. Now, secondly, we see the Lord prepare Peter to minister to Cornelius because, remember, some, a big change is taking place here, one that throws the Jews for a loop, so to speak, because it is so contrary to what they thought God was going to do. The next day, as the three men were approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray, and it was about the sixth hour, which is noon, one of the three customary times for prayer. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that we see, not so much for Cornelius, because he was following the custom of the Jews as a God-fearer, but here's Peter, who is a New Testament believer, and yet he had not set aside the customary practice, Old Testament practice, of these three set times for prayer. And again, I remind you that this, this was the practice of the Jews. David writes in Psalm 55, verse 17, evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. And this is a particular type of complaining and murmuring, the kind that God will, will accept. Notice the, the, uh, the sequence of, of the words. Remember how the Jews c calculated their days from evening to evening? So we might say morning, noon, and evening. They would say evening, morning, and noon, and that would be the day for them. So these were the three set hours of prayer. Just to remind us that Peter did not see, nor should we, see the Old Testament as an antiquated book that we basically kind of tear off and throw away and we're, we're just New Testament believers now. We need to remember that that Old Testament was what Paul was referring to as that which is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction to Timothy. The Old Testament still is in force except for those parts that have been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, for instance, he knew that he didn't have to bring a sacrifice to the temple anymore because Jesus had laid down his life. But he also knew God told him to seek him continuously. And so he continued to use the pattern he had been taught as a part of his instruction in Judaism. Okay? So prayer is an important part of our lives. The fact that we're saved doesn't mean we don't need to pray. The fact that we're saved doesn't mean we, we don't need to obey. The fact that we're saved means that God has given us the power now to obey the things we could not obey from God's holy requirements in the Old Covenant. We couldn't do it before, but now we can because of the grace that He has given to us. He has given us the power to live the kind of life that actually pleases Him. Now, as Peter is praying, he becomes hungry. Um, Jews typically ate two meals a day one that was late morning and one in the evening just before dark. Uh, this would have been that late morning meal, I imagine. But while he was uh, waiting for the food to be prepared, he fell, in, he fell into a trance in which, interestingly, the Lord gives him a vision of a meal that he had prepared for Peter <laughs> on this great sheet that's lowered down from heaven that has on it everything that Peter could not eat according to the dietary law. And the voice comes from heaven saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Well, Peter answers as any faithful Jew would answer, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Here was a man who kept the dietary law his entire life, and he wasn't about to break it now 
he may have thought that this was a test, that God actually expected a negative answer, uh, that he would remain faithful to what God had told him to do. You know, the interesting thing is that the Lord had already told his disciples earlier that the dietary laws were no longer binding. Remember when he said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's not what basically a man eats and goes into his stomach as far as unclean things. But it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. That is what he says because that comes from the heart. And then there's that parenthetical statement in Mark 7, 19, thus he declared all foods clean. Well, that, this wasn't a lesson on the dietary law, was it? That wasn't the point behind it, although Peter perhaps should recognize that's what, not, not what it's about. It had another purpose. Well, the voice answered him and said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Now, this happened three times. It was repeated to confirm the message out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. And then the sheet was taken back up into the sky. Now, it's easy for us to know what that means, you know, what all this is really about. But Peter had no idea. He was focusing on this vision, trying to figure out what in the world was the Lord trying to teach him through it because it just wasn't clear. You know, the funny thing is, God is doing things not exactly like this. He's not giving us visions today, but He is bringing circumstances into our lives all the time. And we need to realize that those are also lessons, just like this lesson He was trying to teach Peter. And we're supposed to reflect on those things and figure out what is He trying to teach me through these circumstances so that we might learn more about how to honor and please the Lord. Well, that, that's what's going on here also with, with Peter. Now, he didn't have to wait very long because as he's reflecting on the vision, the messengers from Cornelius arrived at the door and were asking for him, and the Spirit told him to go with them without hesitation because he had sent them. So he goes down to meet them, and he asks why they've come, and they tell him about Cornelius and the angel to send for him because of a message he had that they needed to hear. So Peter invited them to spend the night left with them in the morning, and he took some of the brethren along with him. So we see, of course, the uh, Cornelius is now prepared, and now we see that Peter is largely prepared, though he's still working his way through this. This is a big transition for Jews to be able then to associate in this way with Gentiles. Now, thirdly, the gospel is preached to the Gentiles. The next day they arrive at Caesarea, Cornelius is waiting for them, and notice he invited all of his relatives and his friends to hear this message as well. Now again, why would a person do that if they were steeled in rebellion against God? They, they wouldn't, right? So here's another way that Cornelius shows the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart. He was not only concerned for himself, he was also concerned for the spiritual well-being of other people. He wanted them to hear this message because he knew it came from God, and he respected God and wanted to honor God. And so, again, this is a great example. This is what the grace of God does in the life of believers. Now, when Peter entered, Cornelius immediately fell to his feet to worship him. But Peter quickly reached down and, and raised him up and told him to stand up because he, too, was just a man. Now, here's the grace of God working in Peter's life the humility that he has. I don't want your worship because he knows if he receives it, for one thing, God's going to deal with him. But he also knew it was dishonoring to the Lord. Only God is to be worshiped. And so he tells him to get up. I don't want that honor. Give that honor to the Lord. And again, that reminds us that we should never take honor and glory to ourselves for something that the Lord is actually the one who does through us. Whatever good thing is in us has come from the Lord. That's why if somebody praises us, we should simply say, the Lord is good. He's the one who's enabled me to do this and give the glory to Him rather than to ourselves. Now, by this time, Peter was beginning to understand what God was trying to teach him in that vision. He said in verse 28, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man 
unholy or unclean. So he's, he's getting, you know, the message. Now, the interesting thing here is that this seems to be overstating the case because God had never actually forbidden the Jews to associate with foreigners or with Gentiles, okay? Um, even as he doesn't forbid us. I mean, the reason why God wanted them to be separate in the Old Testament, he didn't want them to intermarry. He didn't want them to get too close. Otherwise, they might learn their practices and begin to worship their false gods and fall away from him. So God kept his people separate. In the new covenant, he continues to do exactly the same thing. He tells us that we need to be careful that we don't form partnerships that are too close to people, such as entering into business relations with unbelievers where they're partners or particularly in marriage. We do not marry unbelievers. Light and darkness certainly do not mix. Okay? But that doesn't mean that we can't associate with them. P uh, Paul said on one occasion, if that were the case, we'd have to leave the world, right? Because there's no way to keep from doing that. Now, the Lord had only forbidden these close associations. And I think what Peter is reflecting here is what the Jewish leaders were reflecting, who pulled in their skirts. I mean, they have nothing to do with a Gentile. Even Jews that they believed were beneath their dignity. Looks like some of that had rubbed off on, on him. And that seems to be the idea that Peter is reflecting here. But the Lord is correcting this misconception. And even more, he's going beyond this. He's showing Peter that he is now receiving the Gentiles into the closest relationship that could possibly be. And that is into his family and into his church. As I mentioned, Gentile salvation was not a mystery in the Old Testament, but Gentile inclusion with the Jews. I don't know where they were thinking God was going to put the Gentiles. Maybe it was going to be in a separate church beneath them. I don't know. But he had never clearly said that they were going to be on a par with those natural children of Abraham who had believed. Well, Peter then asked Cornelius why he had sent for him. Well, the messengers already told him. But he wanted to hear it from Cornelius to confirm that this was from the Lord and to lead into what he was about to say. So Cornelius repeated the circumstances, which we don't need to go into again. And he said further, now that you have been kind enough to come and all the people that I have invited are present, please tell us what is the message that God wants us to hear. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to have somebody come up to you and say that to you, you know? God tells me that you have a message that I need to hear, and I'm ready to hear it. Why don't you tell me? You know, sometimes the Lord almost does set it up that way if we're willing to be used by Him. Somebody actually wants to come and, and ask us about the gospel, but we know more often than not, it's much more difficult than this. And we see that in the ministry of Jesus. I mean, if people didn't want to listen to the Son of God, how much less are they going to want to listen to us? Or the apostles, oftentimes it is difficult, but sometimes in His mercy, God does prepare a person to this point where they actually are asking to hear it from you. Now, Peter begins with the lesson that God just taught him. God doesn't show person, uh, partiality. Everyone who fears Him and does what is right is welcome, okay? Including the Gentiles, including all the nations under heaven, God is not partial which means we should never show partiality when it comes to talking to people about Christ. Now, the Lord does say if, if they, they look like they're, you know, perhaps threatening you, remember how he says, don't cast your pearl before swine. If you've attempted that and maybe they spit in your face or maybe they threaten you with bodily harm, maybe it's time to back off. But other than that, you know, we don't discriminate. We shouldn't discriminate. God doesn't discriminate. So then, having said this, Peter then preaches the gospel, and again, we see the highlights of the gospel here. God anointed Jesus with His Spirit. He is the Messiah. That's what it means. He's anointed with the Spirit. How He showed that He was from God by healing and delivering those who were oppressed by the devil. He did miracles that prove He was from God. Again, that evidential power of the miracle. How He was crucified and raised the third day. That is essential to the gospel, the death of Christ on the cross how he appeared to those he appointed as witnesses. The witnesses who saw Jesus, that he actually was raised from the dead, is very important because, again, that proves that Jesus is who he said he was. That is also an evidential miracle. How he ordered them to tell everyone these things and that God had appointed Jesus as 
the judge of all mankind, that all will stand before him. But then the very most important, well, not perhaps the most important, but equally important part, how everyone who believes in him will be forgiven. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? The bad news is we're all on our way to hell to suffer for eternity because of our sins. The good news is God is willing to forgive all of our sins if we simply trust in Jesus, receive Him as our Savior, put our whole hope of heaven on what Jesus Christ has done, His obedience, His death on the cross to make us acceptable to God. So again, God prepares the one who's going to receive the message. He prepares the one who's going to give the message. The messenger gives the message finally we see that evidence that proves that God has received them into the church, the first Gentile Pentecost. While he was still speaking, the Spirit fell on those who were listening. And then Peter, I think, as well as those who were with him, were amazed as they heard them speaking in tongues. By the way, speaking in tongues. And what does he say here? Um, they were speaking in tongues and they were declaring uh, the basically the, the works of God, okay? They were exalting God. Every time we see tongues used in the Bible, it, it's basically communicating to people. In this case, you know, Paul says we can pray to God in, in tongues. Here, they're exalting God with their tongues. In other places, they're speaking of the wonderful works of God. But it's never a message from God to man never was, okay? That's not what tongues were for. It was actually meant to be a sign to Jews. And here, it's a sign that God has included them in, in His church. They had received the same gift of the Holy Spirit, which was promised to God's people. Now, again, what that means is the Spirit that the Messiah came anointed with is the one that He, he is giving, and it's given to the Gentiles, that was something the Jews didn't expect. Now, when Peter saw this, he realized, hey, if they have received the Spirit, the same thing that God promised to the Jews, they should also receive the sign of His inclusion in the church, the same sign that the Jews who believe received, which is baptism. And remember, water baptism is simply a visible sign of that invisible reality of the Spirit's baptism of a person into the body of Christ. And so Peter ordered that to be done. Now, again, let me just mention, we saw the Lord receive the Samaritans, but they were only half Gentiles, not full Gentiles. They were basically this, I would just say they were mixed people, you know, came about because of the captivity and so forth. Um, and the Jews despised them, but I think they despised the Gentiles even more. Okay, so half Jew, half Gentiles had come into the family or into the church. He had also received the Ethiopian official, and I think I may have mentioned when we looked at the Ethiopian, that it was debatable, you know, he was a eunuch, and you know that raises certain questions, but um, it was debatable whether he was a full proselyte to Judaism or whether he was just a God-fearer. But he was only one, and there was no mention of the Spirit being given to him. The Lord also ministered to Gentiles in His ministry, the Syrophoenician woman, the centurion who had great faith. But at that time, they were not yet included in the church because the church had not yet been formed at Pentecost. But this is the first time, I should say the New Testament church, this is the first time it was clear that the Lord gave His Spirit to the Gentiles, the same Spirit again that was on the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the first Gentile Pentecost, and this was something new. And it was shocking, shocking to Peter, shocking to those with him. It's going to be shocking to those in Jerusalem who are the leaders of the church. They were amazed, again, that Gentiles could be saved without first having to become Jews. God was bringing them directly into the family. And, you know, that's, again, the question that's going to come up in Acts 15 when the Judaizers are saying basically they need to be circumcised and observed to, you know, uh, basically commanded to observe the law of Moses, and then they're okay. If they're Jews, then they can be saved by Christ. But no, they don't have to become a Jew. A Gentile can come directly into the family of God by trusting in the Lord Jesus. And this, again, was groundbreaking. This was startling. This was something entirely new. 
Uh, and it's going to take a little while for the Jews to assimilate this. But as we see, this is reality. Now, in closing, let me just say two things about this. Again, we've looked at various applications. Here's two last applications. We are looking at the Lord's reception of the first Gentiles into His church. These are the first fruits of God's mercies that would eventually reach around the world and one day will actually fill the earth. But we do need to remember this is the beginning of that movement that eventually came to us. And so first of all, we need to thank the Lord that He included us in His work. That this blessing that was originally meant for the Jews was rejected by the Jews and God has, had, knew that from eternity. It was part of His plan. He would turn to the Gentiles and He would give this blessing to us so that the Jews, seeing the blessing that we're enjoying that was meant for them, would become jealous and then they would turn to the Lord as well. So let's, first of all, be reminded that this story is about us and we should be thankful that God has included us in His church. It is a great privilege to be included in the church of Christ. We're not going to really understand fully what a privilege it is until we stand before Him on the day of judgment, numbered among the sheep rather than the goats, and we receive that eternal kingdom of heaven. But we need to, by faith, be able to see that and thank God for His mercies as well as enjoy the blessings we have now as a part of that family uh, by gathering together and worshiping Him and using the things He has given to us to commune with Him and serving Him and honoring Him in His kingdom. The second thing I wanted us to note was this, <clears throat> that, I mean, notice the Lord's involvement in this whole thing, okay? We saw how He brought Peter, you know, from Jerusalem up to Joppa and now to Caesarea. We see how the Lord has prepared Cornelius, how He prepared Peter. We see all this involvement, and the point here is simply this, that when the Lord wants to save someone, He will save them. He will do it. I mean, all the things that are involved, putting grace in Cornelius' heart to fear Him, sending an angel to direct Him, leading Peter to where he would come in contact with Him, giving him this vision so that he would go and preach to Cornelius, in order that he might receive this blessing. We, sometimes we read these things and we think, gosh, you know, I wish the Lord did these things today, that he was involved in people's lives like this today. Well, you know, the thing is, he is. It's just not quite as obvious, is it? God does prepare people to receive the gospel. God does prepare the messengers to bring that message. God does providentially bring us together uh, to share that message. He's doing the same things today but just in, we might say, in a less obvious way. It's not so clear that it's supernatural, but it is actually it's the same thing. That was a part of God's plan in the New Testament at that particular time. It was a part of His comprehensive plan, His eternal plan. And every time we come in contact with somebody who's an unbeliever, that's a part of His plan as well in exactly the same way. And it's God's will that we share that gospel with them, if we do, in fact, share it. If we don't, then we know it was his, his will that we came together, and that was what He called us to do, but we didn't do it. That, that becomes an issue. That becomes a problem. It's a sin. God will forgive us for it, but we do need to remember that these meetings are divinely ordained by the Lord, and we need to take advantage of them and do what the Lord calls us to do share that good news. So with that in mind, let's remember to keep praying for those people who do not know Him, and let's continue to pray for ourselves that God would help us to be ready when those opportunities come so they don't catch us by surprise. Whenever you meet up with someone, be thinking, I wonder if the Lord's going to give you an opportunity. Instead of being, you know, your mind somewhere else, your intent somewhere else entirely, and the opportunity comes and, oh, 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 I'm not quite ready, and it doesn't happen. If you're ready and you see the opportunity, then you can really just quite easily move into sharing the gospel. And I think that's what we need to take away from, from this. Also, don't be a respecter of persons. God says to share it with everybody indiscriminately. So the gospel is for everyone. We don't withhold it from anyone, regardless of what they may look like. 
All right, well, with this in mind, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us do this, and let's also ask for His help as we prepare to come to the table, remembering that we need to deal with our sins, repent of all of our sins before we come to the table, renew our covenant with the Lord to love Him and serve Him, to trust in His Son alone, and then as we come to the table to look to Jesus for the grace that He offers to us in the table to be renewed in strength. Let's pray.